Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James Agedis, and today we're looking at Bodies, 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 released in 2022. Bodies, Bodies, Bodies is a horror comedy that's structured like a whodunit slasher. During a hurricane, a group of rich 20-somethings play a murder mystery game in a mansion. Before long, the bodies start dropping for realsies, leading to paranoia and the crumbling of superficial friendships. Bodies, Bodies, Bodies began as a spec script written by author Kristen Rupenian. You may know her from Cat Person, the 20 17 New Yorker short story that went viral. A24 bought the script and hired Dutch actor-turned-director Helena Rain, who helped guide a complete script overhaul by screenwriter Sarah DeLapp. They turned a simple slasher with an Agatha Christie story into a perfect depiction of contemporary youth culture. You could call this and then there were none Gen Zers, or ten little Zoomers, if you will. Rain described it as Lord of the Flies meets Mean Girls. This movie is one big ol' heapin' of zeitgeist. The characters speak in Twitter talk and are literally guided by their phones. But this isn't some shallow attack on Gen Z. Director Rain sympathizes, disgusted by her own phone addiction. We laugh at how dumb these characters are, but as individuals, not as representatives. They're vapid and self-centered, and even when they do typical Gen Z things, like passionately engage in social issues, they mostly just make it about themselves. They're rich narcissists who secretly can't stand each other, and are really only interested in partying and getting fucked up. It works because the acting and writing feel so damn real. The talented cast consists of zillennial models, comedians, and a Harvard graduate. Oh, and Lee Pace, who is always awesome. Every character is fully realized. Every line and action shows who they are and what they mean to each other. Bodies is also a technical delight, with amazing sound design, creative lighting, and a killer soundtrack full of bass-heavy hyperpop. But above all else, Bodies, Bodies, Bodies is fucking hilarious. There are so many funny lines and moments, this kill count can't even begin to include them all. He's a Libra Moon that says a lot! This is one of my top three horror films in the most stacked year of the genre I can think of. Definitely watch it for yourself, especially for the mystery element. Then you can come back and watch this kill count and our podcast episode, where Chelsea and I go over why this movie is even funnier in hindsight. You can watch that podcast on the channel or listen to it on some Raycons, who just so happen to be today's sponsor. Raycons provide... Wait, what does that say? <gasps> oh, hell no! Like, I can't do very many accents. Like, I'm bad at most You of them. son of a bitch! Right? What? Oh my god! I read the sponsor script, you bastard! You've been a con man this whole time! James, he's a Ray Con man! Look at him! Oh. Shit, yeah. I guess that would make more sense for a sponsor segment, huh? And it would explain that kit full of Raycon wireless earbuds, headphones, and speakers I found. I just wanted to be prepared for the holiday season. Well damn, man. With their premium sound quality, comfortable fit, and up to 54 hours of battery life, those will make a really good gift. <laughs> I know. I've been stocking up thanks to Raycon's countdown to Christmas, where there's a new deal every day. He even got you these everyday headphones to listen to while you work on the kill count. Aw, these are great. Oh, <laughs> clearly this is just one big misunderstanding. I'm sorry about that, bud. James, he's dying. Yeah. Oh, I'm gonna go try these out. Oh, wow, he even knew I'd like them in the black colorway. Great. Hang in there, Soren. Oh, Chelsea, at my house. I have fitness, gaming, and everyday earbuds for the team. Make sure they get... get... Oh. No! Click the link in the description box or go to buyraycon.com slash deadmeat to get 15% off site-wide with code HOLIDAY. Plus, there are new pop-up deals every day during Raycon's Countdown to Christmas. We'll try to keep the description updated with the latest offers, but you can always go to buyraycon.com slash deadmeat to get the best deals available. When it comes to bodies, are there a lottie in bodies, bodies, bodies? Let's find out and get to the bodies. The movie begins with a sloppy sapphic smoochin' sesh, and it lasts for over a minute, legit. Sophie and her new girlfriend, B are driving together to the Overlook Hotel. Or, wait, sorry, to her friend David's house. David's rich-ass house, holy shit. Yeah, this mansion's big enough to give B pause. She returns to the car to put on a little extra makeup. There, that ought to help fade away the shakeup. Sophie's old chums have gathered here for a hurricane party, though Sophie's presence was not part of the forecast. What is she doing here? Oh, 
I don't know. She's been MIA from this SNL friend group thanks to a recent stint in rehab. I can't believe you're here. Like, last time I saw you, you were coked out on the subway, hissing on the floor like a little hyena. But now Sophie's sober, and with B, who is literally the fish out of water with these clearly popular cool kids. B tries to fit in with some homemade zucchini bread. Yum. But zucchini ain't gonna cut it, girl. Look at this Greg guy. He's popping bottles with swords and shit. The working class B is a nice audience surrogate as an outsider to this toxic friend group. She's also literally Literally an outsider, since she's possibly an emigrant from an undisclosed country. She's perfectly cast with Maria Bakalova, the young Bulgarian actor whose standout performance in the Borat sequel got her the rare Oscar nom for a comedy. As they toast outside, the hurricane begins. For those of us who don't live with this particular natural disaster, hurricane parties are a common way to ride out the rain. You get to hang out with friends and family and find safety in numbers. Of course, most hurricane parties don't take place in fucking mansions. For these rich kids, it's an opportunity to film TikToks and have a good time, dancing like it's the night before battle in Zion. They couldn't care less about the actual toll this disaster can take on other people. Can you turn that off? It's bumming me out. Sophie's opting out of the substances, determined to stay sober. She's here to see her childhood friend David, played by professional babe dater Pete Davidson. I know a lot of people hate Davidson, but I don't know. He seems all right to me. I'm playing David. He's kind of a dick, so it's a really big stretch for me. Lead makeup artist Sarah Grawman covered up Davidson's extensive tattoos with a high-performance airbrush foundation. David comes from old money, a lot of it, so his family is probably traditional. Davidson's kind of ink wouldn't fly. Sophie's friends get to know the humble bee a bit. She's an immigrant, but not from Moscow or Kazakhstan. She's only been with Sophie for six weeks, and despite not normally drinking, she's willing to imbibe for the sake of fitting in, a central theme to the film. Let's go! <laughs> Yeah, B, get buzzed! In turn, B, and the audience, gets a quick rundown on Sophie's friend group. David's actress girlfriend Emma is nice, if a little vapid. Alice is bubbly and gregarious, but also insecure and self-centered. Are you talking about me? She's brought along her older boyfriend Greg, a super sexy vet. David's majorly jealous of Greg, both his booze bottle popping and his hot body rocking. Like, I feel like... I'm more attractive than that. Finally, there's Sophie's confrontational ex-girlfriend, Jordan, who warns B to stay wary of her new lover. The party gets going with substances and sweat aplenty. This is a damn hormone hurricane. It gets so hot and heavy, Sophie cools things down with a suggestion. Who wants to play bodies, bodies, bodies? Oh, fuck. Holy shit, I love Alice in the background screaming, yes! yes! The titular parlor game finds the group trying to suss out a secret killer who tries to take out the other players between rounds. It's your basic secret identity game that's been around long before Among Us. Some people call it werewolf, some people call it mafia, we call it Mordenartje, which is a Dutch word. The premise of the game also ties into the movie's theme of needing to belong. Before they can begin, they have a round of slappy shots. He's not that into it, no matter how slappable David's face is. He shows her how it's done with a schoolyard sucker punch to Greg. Luckily, Greg's a grown-ass man who often meditates. So without saying a word, he takes a shot and removes himself from the situation. He ain't looking to Marmaduke it out with David. When it came to those slaps, the actors wanted to do them for real. They did, but the real slaps didn't make it into the movie. And they said that the real smack didn't look like a real smack. Yeah. yeah. They said it seemed weak in comparison. <laughs> yeah. What did make the cut is the real punch Pace asked Davidson to deliver. We heard that crack. Yeah, that was on Lee's really? stunning face. I was asking for it. And I, and, I, and I really enjoyed it. After finishing their Paul Newman film of a warm-up, they turn out the lights and get all Bray Wyatt up in this bitch. With the game underway, B crawls around, scaring Alice and getting spooked by Greg. This mansion would be a blast to play a game like this in. Sounds like it was also a great shooting location. Production designer April Lasky found this empty mansion in Hudson Valley, specifically Chappaqua, an enclave so exclusive and rich the freaking Clintons live there. Almost the entire movie was filmed on the property of this 20,000 square foot Georgian stone manor named Rosewood. Its remote location proved perfect for quarantining the cast and crew during the COVID production. You can still find this place's listing when it was going for 7 mil. But why is that pool so far away from the house? Gotta take a golf cart to go swimming. Eventually, someone remembers the name of this movie. Body, body, body! 
Greg has been found dead on the floor, and in most horror movies, this is where the killing would start. It'd be revealed that Greg was actually dead, and chaos would ensue. But right as the group and the audience starts to think that's the case, David brings the pie maker back to life with a frosty beer sack tap. Accusations start flying, like they do in Secret Identity games, and a real argument breaks out, like they do in Secret Identity games. David antagonizes Greg so much, he's once again forced to remove himself from the situation. I think it's time for me to put myself to bed. I love Lee Pace's performance as the middle-aged dude who just wants to have a good time. He is painfully aware of how much older and more mature he is than everyone around him. You kids have fun. David then turns his dictitude towards his girlfriend, Emma. You're always gaslighting me. Gaslight, shut up, it's a fucking dumb word. I actually gotta go with David here. Gaslighting is a specific thing and the word's been way overused the past few years. It doesn't mean anything. Other than the fact that, like, you read the internet, or like, congrats, you have a Twitter account. The argument makes Emma cry, so everyone votes David out of the game. Fuck this game! And this glass! And this wall! During a second helping of slappy shots, the storm takes out the power and their cell phone reception. They split up for different tasks, and we follow B as she looks for a bathroom. On the lower floor of the house, she finds dear David outside, tap tap tapping on the glass, waving through a window. There's an amazing bit of sound design as B runs out to join the others, crowding around David's dead body. He's bled out from a deep slit to his throat, and this time, the body is for real. As the girls run to Sophie's car, the awesome score kicks in. It was done by Disasterpiece, who also composed the incredible music for It Follows. Inside the car, in an endlessly spinning That 70s Show shot, they learn the battery is dead. B accidentally left the mirror lights on after touching up her face. It's the only vehicle there, since another friend named Max took the other one and never returned. Max is this weird, unseen specter throughout the movie. He's the the one who gave David that black eye by punching him in the face, after which he fled the house, never to return. The girls begin to think that he might be the killer. I'm just saying, like, where the fuck is he? Jordan finds blood stains on David's parents' Gurkha sword. That makes her think Greg might be guilty. After all, he's nowhere to be found, and he's had experience using the sword. Lee Pace practiced sabering a champagne bottle at home using the hobbit sword he had playing Thranduil, the Elven King. Jordan says Greg is a dangerous stranger, since Alice has only known him for two weeks. She doesn't even know his middle name. You don't ask what your middle name is, okay? For a really long time. This whole movie is hilarious to me, but this scene and another one near the end are especially memorable because of their dialogue. Relax, relax, relax. You're silencing me. That line was improvised by actor Rachel Sennett. When it came to Gen Z dialogue, 46-year-old director Helena Rain relied on screenwriter Sarah DeLapp, a playwright best known for The Wolves. Rain also made things sound legit by having her cast improvise. She'd film with two cameras and not call cut, then capture whatever the actors did naturally. Cinematographer Jasper Wolf shot handheld and treated the camera like another character, reacting to the improvised dialogue. Wolf also shot Rain's first feature, Instinct, which stars Rain's longtime close friend, Carice Van Houten. Their suspicions of Greg are raised when they find his REI sampler bag, full of practical things like a knife and a headlamp. No Infinity Stones, though. Ronan been slacking. Also doesn't help when they find Greg sleeping in the house's basketball court, wearing a freaking purge mask. It's his sleep therapy mask, and when they wake him up, Greg claims he couldn't hear them over the white noise in his headphones. Thinking that they're still playing werewolf, he starts howling and chasing them around. I practically pissed myself laughing at his playful joy in contrast to their sheer terror. He quickly realizes this hunting party means business, so he efficiently disarms Sophie to keep himself safe. I love that this movie can go from funny to legitimately tense. This scene is suspenseful as hell, as you wonder what's gonna happen next. In the end, Greg grabs the knife to keep Sophie from getting it, so B bashes him in the back of the head with a kettlebell. Twice, actually, after he makes a final lunge. I guess plan B is effective. It's a traumatic event. Event, at least for Alice. Jordan justifies it with some serious bias. If you look at all of us, like, on paper, logically, he is the most likely to commit an act of violence. On paper? She mentions Greg's military service as another indicator. Only problem is, dude wasn't that kind of vet. He was a veterinarian. He was a veterinarian's assistant. Are you fucking serious right now? 
While I'm sad about Greg's death and it makes me like B less, I also find it hilarious why they accused him, these dumb idiots. They found it suspicious he had a map and supplies with him, even though it was just because he's a prepared 40 year old. Zombie pukes from her act of murder! And while she's changing, Sophie falls off the wagon. Actor Amanda Stenberg gets good and scary playing a relapsed addict here. She blows up on Emma in a vicious and personal way, but later makes peace with pills. I guess friendship is pharmaceuticals. I love how the self-centered Emma initially thinks Sophie has the hots for her. Great acting moment from Chase Sweet Wonders, who was born and raised in the Detroit area, hell yeah! There's another scene of everyone looking for each other, which highlights the movie's creative lighting. It's hard to film a movie in the dark with realistic motivated lighting, but Bodies manages to do it. Production designer April Lasky installed emergency exit signs and other environmental light sources, while the actors light each other and themselves using instruments that are also relevant to their characters. Jordan, the take charge type A character, uses Greg's practical headlamp. Alice, the party girl, is lit by glow sticks, turning her into a human lighthouse. B uses her phone, which is tethered around her neck, because she's always talking to and texting with her mom, whom she has to take care of. Eventually, Alice trips over Emma's stone cold dead body, extra bloody at the bottom of a staircase. Come on, Alice, you're supposed to yell bodies, bodies, bodies! They figure that someone must have pushed her down the stairs, and Alice angrily points out this new body proves Greg innocence. They get into a slumber party massacre huddle to figure out who might be the killer. Alice begins accusing B and Jordan piles on. Things get pretty shovey and B is forced out of the house. Locked out of all this place's various entrances, she retreats to Sophie's car where she gets dangerously cheesy. She also finds an interesting artifact, a pair of yellow panties. They match a bra she found earlier, which Jordan said was hers. B returns to the house and watches through a window as Jordan takes a gun out of a drawer. She crawls back inside through the longest doggy door I've ever seen. Freaking doggy subway more like it. She finds the others and tattles on Jordan's secret sidearm, but Jordan empties her pockets and denies B's accusations. B wins back Sophie's trust by opening up about her personal life. She says she has to take care of her mom, who has borderline personality disorder. Alice can relate. I have body dysmorphia. Oh my god, shut the fuck up, Alice. Jordan can't stand this heartfelt moment between her ex and this B, so she pulls out her gun and starts waving it around. Another very Gen Z argument breaks out, full of accusations of ableism and charges of group chat neglect. Jordan tells B that she and Sophie slept together before they came here, something Sophie denies, but B already knows is true, after finding those panties in the car. It's the conversational climax of this movie, with another standout performance by Rachel Sennett, especially when the put-downs are leveled at her podcast. A podcast takes a lot of work! I've seen a lot of love for Sennett in this film, both from audiences and her co-stars. Rachel is one of the funniest people I've ever met in my entire life. Alice starts getting personal against Jordan, who impulsively responds by shooting Alice in the leg. Jordan is such a pathological liar, she denies doing what everyone just saw her do. Did you just fucking shoot me? My Hala Harold is excellent as the pugnacious Jordan. During my second watch through, I noticed a lot of her understated, hilarious line deliveries. The frenemies get into a good old fashioned girl pile, and we all know what's coming next. Ow! <laughs> In the confusion, Alice was shot through the neck, quickly killing this little Shiva baby. Yeah, no fixing that amount of blood leak. Jordan continues to deny any guilt while still brandishing the gun. She'll rue the day she threatens Sophie though, since B gets the jump on her from a hallway upstairs. After a short fight, Jordan gets some air over the banister and crashes through a glass table down below. Her last words are telling B to check Sophie's texts. Her last action is to shoot at them. Sophila and the B hide together in a sauna, which deep P. Jasper Wolf said was one of the smallest locations he's ever shot in. Dude had to light the actors with a flashlight he balanced in his hands while holding the camera. Both women reaffirmed that they didn't kill David, but when Sophie still lies about sleeping with Jordan, it breaks B's trust, causing her to run away scared. B hides from Sophie until the sun comes up and starts her morning jog off with a final girl circuit. Nothing better than a tour of all the bodies, 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 except the guy she left pushing daisies in the basketball court. Amidst the messy hurricane 
aftermath, Sophie tries to cuddle her way back into B's heart. B responds by pointing the gun at her. You know, something tells me this relationship isn't gonna work out. B asks for Sophie's phone so she can check her texts, but instead of handing it over, Sophie tosses it aside. In true youth fashion, the girls fight over the phone instead of the gun that's lying right there. When they finally get a hold of it, they realize it's not Sophie's. It's David's phone, and after unlocking it with his dead face, they come across an incredible discovery. Turns out David was shooting a TikTok earlier to try to outswordplay Greg. During his attempt, he slit his own throat, meaning the death that kicked this whole thing off was self-inflicted by an envious idiot. Greg was then murdered by bias and groupthink. Emma died from a tumble down the stairs after getting woozy from the pills Sophie gave her. Alice was killed by accident, and Jordan in self-defense. This was a whodunit without any who that done it. But the ending wasn't always that way. In the original script by Kristen Rupenian, there was an actual killer. Director Rayin and screenwriter Delap changed it, so the characters' deaths came of their own doing. It's all kicked off by David and his fragile male ego. His pressure to feel strong wound up getting himself killed and the ripple effect of that killed all his friends. This ending also drives home the theme of social media addiction. And we're not really looking at what's really going on. And if these characters would do that for one moment, the movie would stop. Just as this realization washes over them, someone arrives. The unseen Max, finally returned after his fight with David. He's played by Connor O'Malley, one of Chelsea's favorite comedians. She's minion squad for life, man. Max asks them what happened right as the power and reception return. Shocked, it's the only thing B can respond with. I have reception. How many kills, kills, kills were in bodies, bodies, bodies? Well, let's find out at the numbers, numbers, numbers. Hey! It's really not that hard. Shockingly. Expected way more of a mess. Five people died in Bodies, 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 so I guess it should be called Bodies, 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 Bodies. The victims were three women and two men, making this Hurricane Party pie chart. We've seen this count in gender breakdown four times before on this show, across a variety of very different horror movies. With a runtime of 94 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 18.8 minutes. I'll give the Golden Chainsaw for coolest kill to David. Rarely has a mystery reveal made me laugh so hard. Dude killed himself, making a TikTok out of envy and kicked off this whole dumbass night. It's perfect. Dolmachetti for lamest kill will go to Emma, I guess, found dead after a drugged up tumble down the stairs. And that's it. Bodies, Bodies, Bodies came out in 2022, and I bet it'll mean as much to kids today as Scream meant to people my age. Next week is Malignant, if all goes well, but until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this Kill Count. Yes, next week is Malignant, and after that is Prey. I know originally it was supposed to be Last Night in Soho and Nope, but things got changed, and if you think about it long enough, you might be able to figure out why. Also, if you didn't notice, I'm wearing a Be Good People sweater. Now, this isn't available on deadmeatstore.com just yet, but it will be in one week from today, assuming you're watching this the day it comes out. Now, with Be Good People merch, we don't take a single cent of profit. Literally all profits go to a charity, in this case, the National Network work of abortion funds. That's a charity that provides labor and financial support to local abortion funds around the country. So in one week, this and other Be Good People merch will be available and you can buy them to support that cause. I want to thank some patrons like Aaron Grace, Alyssa Dowdy, Keith, DeCheg, Jordan Privet, Sitka Six, and Jaden Thomas Young. Thanks everybody. Read the shirt.